Hello, everyone. I am excited today to introduce a Penn State AE and a lighting designer with over 35 years of experience. Uh, we have with us today Chip Israel, who is the founder and CEO of the Lighting Design Alliance out in California, as well as a past president and fellow of not only the Illumination Engineering Society, but also the International Association of Lighting Designers. So, Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chip. Unfortunately, everything's downhill from there after Jay's introduction, but um, we're kind of passionate about lighting and I hope that's infectious. But I also understand that probably 80% of you don't think much about lighting or don't think it will impact your career. So what I've done is kind of a presentation that talks a little bit about lighting, but there's a lot of life lessons that are in here. And I really wanna share with you that um, all of your experiences here will make you a better practitioner, whether you go into structural or construction. If you have, I'm going to call it the understanding of what we try to do with lighting, you'll end up with better projects. And we'll go through kind of this marketing cycle. And we're going to try to give you a lot of business facts as we go through here. And as you heard, I'm really old. I've been doing this for a long time. So we're going to share some stories too, because that just kind of gives you some relation between that. But first of all, I want to know a little bit about you. So uh, Jay, do you want to ask the first question? Okay, this is a test. It's a hard one. So Okay. It's about what I guess. I like the maybes because uh, hopefully this will scare you away from it or it will actually kind of entice you to experiment or to, I'm gonna say, investigate it a little bit more. So that's great. And while we're doing this, let's ask what the second question is too. Jay, can you do the number two? Or do I have to hit relaunch or? Okay, there we go. Okay, so I understand that this is new to you. And to be honest with you, I didn't even know it was until I started working in the field and that was after five years. So as your third year, we get it. You don't understand what lighting is and you have this preconception that it's calculations and it's nerdy type of stuff. And there is part of that, but there's also a very artistic side of that. So, okay, we're going to close that down for now. And we're going to go through. And I'm going to start off with a, a story. This gentleman is Ron Rezik. Okay. His wife worked for us at one point, and um, he was a professor at UCLA in industrial design. You've probably never heard of him, but this is his design. He was sitting on the beach here, and yes, it's just like Baywatch, okay? Um, but the um, lifeguards had this clunky lifesaver, like the round ring, and he was sitting there watching them trying to dive out through the waves and to swim with this donut, okay? And he's not even a professional at this point, but he said, isn't there a better way to do? And my favorite guy is the Dyson guy, right? He takes something very simple, like a vacuum cleaner or a hair dryer, and says, you know, we've been designing it the same way for the last 20 years or 50 years. Maybe is there a better way to approach this? Well, Ron did this, and he actually came up with a product, an idea, and then literally it became, um, I'm going to say, an impetus for design. So to me, design is about solving problems. And many people think of designers as, you know, those fashionable New York people that wear black coats and black shirts and black everything and walk with a cane and stuff. And that's maybe one type of designer, but some of the best designers are the ones that solve problems and create spaces for people. So Ron went um, on to kind of develop a lighting company. Maybe you've seen he's got a lot of different um, fixtures that were sold under his name and under Artimity, if you're familiar with those companies, and then created a whole new line of not light fixtures, but fans. So if you know Modern Fan Company, those are all his designs. 
But probably the most important thing that I ever took from him was this, okay? Does anybody know what this thing is? It should have been one of your test questions, but basically it's an old carousel slide projector, okay? And your parents probably had one of those, but basically it was a bunch of images you dropped in and you projected onto the wall. And if you notice the most important thing is the box, because when I was growing up, you had to use the box to put the, uh, as to act as a stand, but this is how we would share information. You couldn't just go on Google and download an image and put it into a PowerPoint presentation. But what Ron said is, there is nothing new in design. Okay, you go out and you experience things and you think about them and they're basically back in your subconscious. And when you do a design, you're not copying them, but you're recalling some of those issues. So what I'm trying to challenge you, not only to look at lighting, but to look at any space that you go into and start to create these slide images in your mind. You go to a restaurant, what did you like about it? What did you hate about it? Okay, and that's gonna add to your experiential level. Okay, it's gonna add to your credibility level. And this is ultimately to the point where you might become a consultant one day and you're gonna redraw upon those things. So what we really want you to do is number one is pay attention. Okay, pay attention to this class because it's really, really good. No, we're gonna give you a lot of just tidbits that can help you in your career, whether you're doing lighting or not. But remember, everything that you are looking at and if you evaluate it, you'll come back and use it someday, whether you're consciously doing it or subconsciously doing that. Okay, and the other thing, and this is when you see a black slide with red lighting, that's one of your life lessons, okay? And I'm saying keep an open mind. And why? Okay, I was in your seat, okay? Albeit a long time ago and things. But anyway, I remember sitting in structure classes and we're going over earthquake codes. I'm from Bucks County, right? Okay, or the East Coast of Pennsylvania. And I'm like, who cares? Okay. And yes, we've lived or learned about it. And back then, I actually graduated with two of the options, both structural and the environmental option, which was lighting, air conditioning, and, and acoustics. And then they said, my parents actually said, oh, the LEADS program was starting. And they're saying, you know, you should go study abroad. And I can remember telling my parents, you know, the country of the U.S. is so big, I'll never get to see it. Okay. Um, and I really want to maybe travel around that. You know, they pushed me to get a passport and, you know, I didn't want to do it and things. Well, fast forward, I now live in California and we have earthquakes. Okay. And what I learned in those classes, I apply, maybe not on all of our projects, but it does affect lighting. For example, Will your pendant lights swing and crash into a window, okay? So maybe that's how it applies to lighting, but we also own a couple of office buildings and houses. We're constantly remodeling those things. So the things that you learn in all of your classes there, you're gonna use again, I guarantee you that, um, but never say never. Um, you know, I'm flashing my passport here. I literally run out of pages in them, okay? I have visas from Saudi Arabia. Think about it. My last name is Israel and I'm going to places I've never even dreamed about. And I get to meet some of the greatest people. So if you like to um, travel, this is a great opportunity, not only through the school, um, but more importantly, after it is part of work. And you know what? You're gonna gather more experiences. What are you supposed to be doing? Taking those Kodak slide images and putting them away. You'll come back and to use them in the long run. Even my daughters got to um, study abroad, which was kind of neat. And my daughters are your guys' age, so we can relate to the questions that you're going through. Actually, they're a little bit older, but anyway. The other thing about architectural engineering, I guarantee you, no matter, that's two guarantees now, but you're gonna do a once in a lifetime project. I don't care if you work for Turner, whether you work for um, IM Pay's office or you work for a structural engineer, you're gonna do a great project somewhere in your career. As a lighting consultant, we get to do one every year. We're really, I'm gonna say it's selfish, okay? We want it all. We work with the best teams, the, some of the greatest architects around. Some of the jobs we can't even share with you. Some of the newest ones were done because we have to sign NDAs or non-disclosure agreements with these things. But I can tell you, when I came out of school, I worked for Lutron Electronics, a dimmer company because I had that experience when I went to a designer, I got to do the lighting controls for the Oval Office and the um, White House. 
I mean, that's pretty trick when you're, you know, 25 years old and you're working on a project like that. Um, through a Penn State alumnus, Bob Holland, I think he's still teaching there or he was up to a, a year or two ago. I got hired on our first Disney hotel. And back then, Disney was very, very um, difficult to get a job with. They were very selective. Well, once I got one, then we got four hotels with Disney. But more importantly, we used that and we were able to get other theme projects like the Venetian, if you've ever been to Las Vegas or Macau, or for you people that know the swamps of New Jersey, the Borgata, large scale casinos. Um, and we did a house in India, okay? Who would ever think that we'd be doing residential lighting, but we did a house in India. And I just wanna kind of share some of these. So the Oval Office, you've seen it on lots of TV shows and shows you how old I am. That's President Reagan at the time. And he's actually holding a dimmer in his hand, the remote control for the dimmers. This is our first built Disney job. We did another one with Antoine Predock, if you're familiar with them. And what we learned about was teamwork, okay? There was 20 different consultants on this, the graphics consultant, the interior designer, the historian. And this was also Disney's first green hotel, very energy efficient. And up to that time, they were using all incandescent lighting. And you've probably heard about that. Oh, that's that old light bulb that's bad. It wastes energy, it's hot. Well, we had to educate Disney on why they wanted to use, at that time, the current technology was called compact fluorescent. Why? If you notice, our light fixtures are made out of leather. This fixture, the chandelier is 17 feet tall. In the background, the ceiling drum fixtures in the corridors or on the wall sconces are all made out of stretched leather. What happens when you put a high heat behind stretched leather? It basically cracks, dries out and gets ruined. So we wanted to use these low heat sources. Of course, technology has changed and you guys all probably have heard about LEDs, lighting emitting diodes, which are great technologies. They have some of their limitations. But to me, this is really where I learned to work with a team. So we wanted it to look like, just in the past, Frank Lloyd Wright, if you're familiar with him, he was an ultimate architect that designed everything, the house, the furniture, the silverware on the table. Okay, now we have all these people spread all over the world. And how do you come back to a cohesive design? Because we don't want 20 different consultants going 20 different ways. So a lot of this is you create a storyline. There's a consistent feel. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever gone to this site, okay? We get a lot of people that have all been there on vacation with their family, but have really looked at the lighting. So there's a lot of things going on here. These giant chandeliers, if you look really closely, there's eight mini down lights in each one. They actually are lighting the floor. OK, but no one ever knows that they're there because we've concealed them. And these things glow softly. And up in the rafters, there's accent lights that highlight the fireplace. And the, hot, the strata of the fireplace is the same exact one as the Grand Canyon. And there's a big totem pole over here. And there's a whole story that goes with that. But more importantly, it's the feel. You feel that these fixtures are lighting the space. Well, if you notice there's hot spots on the ceiling, one above each fixtures, hidden on the beams are up lights. So you feel and you think that the light is coming from the chandelier. Because what have we found over time is if the light fixture is bright enough to light the space, it kind of becomes a glare source. You don't want to see it. So we're trying to trick your eyes, just like in a theater a television show, a stage set of how we're creating spaces. And more importantly, we're getting the light down to the floor. But if you notice there's table and floor lamps that brings the scale down. So you're in this eight story space and it feels as comfortable as your living room. Even the outside, you know, they wanted some prominence of the building but we're trying to make it feel like a 1920s national park building. If we floodlit this, if we did color changing light, it would be the totally wrong effect or feeling. And we use little lights along here, 26 watt compact fluorescence in jelly jar, or I'm sorry, honey glass fixtures. They don't light the road, they outline it. And oh my God, Disney's lawyers, they're like, you have to light the, ro the road, it has to be so bright, we're gonna get sued. And the reality of it is you land an airplane on a runway and runways are not illuminated. They're outlined with lighting. 
And so the same thing, your job is when the client or the contractor says no, if you're passionate about it, then the reality of it is you can fight for it and win. And the director of design for Disney is called Wing Chow. He's now retired, but his point is, if they ask you, what is your design and you can't answer it, then you don't have one, okay? So you have to not look at light levels, but close your eyes, think of how you want this space to feel, and then start layering the lighting into the spaces. Well, once this job was started and actually finished, it created a lot more opportunities, both with Disney. This is the Animal Kingdom Lodge. We did all of the expansions. We did not do the original one, okay? And why, when it was first done, Disney had this test. This is a quarter. You all know what a quarter is. You have one in your pocket. They would take it, flip it up in the air. And when it fell on the ground, if you could read if it's heads or tails, then they determined there was enough light. On this job, they flipped it up and they couldn't find the quarter. They knew they had a safety issue. So we have to create spaces that look good. And in this case, the original designer wanted to feel like you're in the um, the deserts of Africa or on the safari with very low light levels. And that's very appropriate, but there were still trip and fall hazards. We have to make sure that we protect the people too. But coming in and solving problems like that led to other projects. So we've done hotels for Disney literally around the world. This one's in Hawaii. We've done them in Hong Kong, Shanghai, um, Singapore. But the whole idea is try to find the architectural lighting. It's all in there, but we work really hard to conceal it, okay? So that the idea is you think that these um, basically hollowed out gourds, which is traditional in Hawaii, not tiki torches like you see on Hawaii Five O, and the idea of hiding lights to light up this historic mural that goes around the building. So you think that these are your light sources, but it's actually coming from hidden light sources. To us, that's the treasure of doing thematic type of lighting. And when I was at Penn State, I never thought about lighting in this way. I always thought about how many foot candles or how much light you need to fall on a surface so that I could see. That's important, but this starts to create how you can create unique spaces and really become the designer that you can be. Here's another one in Tokyo, just to show you the, you know, more of the gingerbread type of feel. And the nice thing that you get is Every job is different. And I'm not gonna make fun of architects. My daughter's one actually works for Genzer, but the reality is they can work on one job for a year or two, or if it's a hospital, maybe it's five years. And we get to work on 300 different jobs a year. And that's what's so great about always having some in construction, some in design, um, some in the CD portion of the drawings. Then they led to this, this is the Venetian. Um, Las Vegas. And the whole idea is if you were there a long time ago, probably before you were all born, but they had a volcano across the street and they had literally two pirate ships that would fight each other. And when we did this building, they're like, we're going to have a show on here. When we were finished with the design, the building became the show. Everybody came there to take their picture in front of the, the backgrounds. But why does it work? Because it feels very natural. It feels just like if you were in Italy itself. And doing tricks like the owner said, I'm spending all this money on the canals. I want to light them up. And we're like, no, you can't. You have to let them go dark so you see the reflection in there. And that's you understanding how the physics of light work. That's what you're going to learn in the next um, couple of years there. But it's how you apply it that you become artistic in its nature. The interiors almost become opulent and we have a lot of indirect lighting, but if you do a lot of indirect lighting, the space feels a little bit cloudy on the inside because there's no shafts of light. And think about it. We have evolved on how to see over the last 100,000 years. When caveman was outside, what was the source? It was the sun that created shadows. It's natural for us to have shadows and non-uniform lighting. And that's very different than what I'm going to call the illuminating engineering point of view, where it's all about evenness of light. We want drama and therefore less even type of lights. Even inside, this is inside the spaces. Working from a technical standpoint to even though that this giant ceiling is a big barrel vault, how can you work to evenly illuminate it? And like I just said, then that could become, I'm going to call it this diffuse type of lighting. 
coming back and taking the facades and putting lights behind the windows, highlighting some columns, some balconies, adding pedestrian scale light pictures. That's what makes this feel credible, even though you're inside and you really think that you're in an outside type of space. Back to New Jersey on your coast. So the whole idea is that you get involved in buildings and you always have to compromise on your design. And I'm not saying that's a, a downside, but you have to work with the rest of the teams. In this case, doing the facade type of lighting using a pinstripe effect that's literally hidden behind perforated metal. It disappears during the daytime, but it is visible at nighttime. Now, people are moths, okay? That's one of your things um, to remember. People are attracted to brightness just like a moth is to a flame. You can use that. Why? Well, think about it. In hospitality, we can make sure the port cashier is bright so the taxi driver doesn't run over, uh, sorry, the Uber driver, right? You guys don't use taxis. But the idea is we can light spaces, light the ceiling and light the wall. The glass now becomes transparent and we're leading people in. We're actually doing graphic wayfinding. We're using light to direct people. And think about how important just that thought is. People are moths. If you're doing a retail store, you can direct people to things you want them to buy. Same way, if it's an outside space, you can direct people to the spaces you want them to be in and um, not to go where you don't want them to be. So it's a really important critical idea that Lighting is powerful, okay? Not only does it make things look pretty, but it can affect people's emotions and actually can make them do certain things that you want them to do. As we get to the interior, so obviously by the glass over here, you can see the exteriors. You have to know your materials. The first thing the interior designer said is, the floor is gonna be polished marble, highly polished. So we said, we need to do indirect type of lighting, bounce lighting off the ceiling, because if we just did a million down lights, you would just see them reflecting in the floor. And notice how we light a surface and not light a surface and light a surface. That gives you dimension. This is not an evenly illuminated space. Behind the registration desk, the, this wall is the brightest, most dynamic thing. Why? People are drawn to it, right? We can lead them in. And as you detail things, okay, we put a light underneath the registration desk. How do you design it so you don't see the reflection in that polished stone? Or the idea is that we can change the colors of these um, glass walls. They're rear illuminated. Back then in the mid 90s, that was hard to do with color changing LEDs. You guys probably have that in your own apartments and things. So you're taking cutting edge technology and you're trying to apply it in a very simplistic manner that the client can afford, but also can afford to maintain. And if you look, the detailing of these coves are poorly done. The light's getting trapped or cut off by the edge of the cove. So the center of the cove is dark. So we had to come in here and we literally just took the lights, put them up on a two by four by raising them up. They look just like this center cove. So part of your education is gonna be going out into the field, seeing what looks right and what doesn't. And the things that don't look right, you need to change. You have to always make them better. So by knowing your materials, you know how they react to lighting, a really critical fact that most people just think about shooting lights down from the ceiling. And if you notice here, we have lights coming in all different directions, front lighting, back lighting, up lighting and down lighting. Okay, here's your next test. This is a building that we did. Once again, me from you know Eastern Pennsylvania, I'm never gonna go anywhere. This is a house we designed. You can see it in the background. We're not allowed to show any pictures of it, okay? The house is for one family. It is 28 stories tall. It's been in several magazines where it can only show pictures of magazines. This is the Bollywood star, the wife of the husband, the family owns this house. And we're doing a commercial job for them right now that is 9 million square feet. Okay, so Jay, did you ask the question? Did they vote? The uh, we'll trust you. Question? 
Oh, no, I thought, oh, sorry, I missed one. Okay, well, we, there was supposed to be another one here. Guess how much this costs. Well, I screwed up on your poll, so, okay. There is 600 staff members to run this house. There's one floor that's a ballroom. And remember, he uses it for meetings. She'll have fashion shows to raise money for charities. The entire ceiling is a crystal chandelier from Swarovski Crystal. Um, the house is reported to have cost one to two billion dollars, okay? So when I was in your seat, you know, several decades ago, okay, lots of decades ago, I never thought I would have this type of exposure. So that comes back to the beginning, never say never, okay? So what are some of the possible career paths? And I don't care if you're thinking about lighting or whether you're thinking about structures or even architectural design. I know a lot of interior designers that now sell furniture or whatever, but you can go into design and I'm gonna share some things. I never thought I was a very good designer and now I'm very good. Why? Because I've listened to all the people around us. I've learned from them. You can become a specialist. By a specialist, typically that will mean a consultant. And you know, it's really simple. Um, and what's nice about it, you can get paid. For example, you know, we're gonna talk about restaurants. It's about lighting the faces, the food and the space. Well, someone called me into a restaurant that was a fish restaurant in Santa Monica. And, whoops, sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, and it had a giant green neon fish on the roof or on the ceiling. Now, just imagine what happens when green neon is lighting your date's face, lighting your food. There was a reason why nobody likes staying in this. And just by going there, having the overall AE experience, you can charge them thousands of dollars to say, turn off the sign and do this over here and things. You can get into sales, whether you sell lighting products, you know, and, and that sounds, we call um, typically sales or manufacturing the dark side, right? In the fact that it's, it's not credible. It's like being a lawyer, it's sleazy and stuff. Absolutely not. And I worked for a manufacturer, Lutron Electronics, and I learned so much by being there I also learned that I didn't want to be there my whole career, but I learned the information there and I took it not only how to use dimmers and controls properly, but the insides of how to manufacture products, how to sell products, how to do customer service. Why is that important? Someday you may own your own business and you guys are getting a great education on construction and architectural engineering services, but you're really not learning business facts. Okay, so trying to get all of that can really work. And then obviously construction, you know, whether you're a full time construction manager or whether or not you're a project manager, which means you're coordinating all of these different things. All of these will utilize your experiences. There's no right and bad reasons. And I'd really share is many of you will do multiples of these things. It's very rare when one person does one their entire career. And especially if you love what you're doing, you know, you always reach out and try to always push that. What I really like to say in lighting design, you can do all of those. So if you're not sure, you can literally get a good basis and go into any one of these uh, different areas. So. so let's talk about design. I said, I didn't think I was really that talented of a designer. And I remember struggling through some of the early architectural courses, but design takes so many different ways. When I was a kid, we had Lincoln logs. I don't know if you've ever even heard of those things. They were actually designed by Frank Lloyd Wright's grandson, which is kind of a fun fact if you're a nerd. But I think we probably all played with Legos. If anybody's in the AE department, they probably had those as a kid or they loved coloring or doing art. Okay, that may be that you have that intrinsic art um, side of you. If you're left-handed, we find tremendous amount of, um, I'm gonna call it, people that are left-handed in these design and creative fields. If you like taking your pictures in front of Instagram moments, okay? So you can probably appreciate that someone had the vision to create the background for you to go stand at. And that's a huge part of our job now because we want to turn that into a marketing effect. Or if you play, I'm gonna call it video games where you're playing architect and building houses or cities, or maybe you just love watching 
you know, the HG channel where you're seeing people, you know, fix houses and flip them and stuff. That just shows that you have a passion for design, even though you may not think that you're good at design. I'm sure you probably all heard from your parents and your guidance counselor, oh, you're good at math and science. You should go into engineering. Well, I got pushed that way. I didn't even know what architectural engineering was when I um, basically started. I wanted to be an architect. My dad said, you're good at engineering. I ended up in AE and I loved it once I was there. And the same thing with lighting. I could probably be just as happy working in the HVAC side or the structural side. It's all about really trying to do the mundane tasks, but really get involved in doing those once in a lifetime projects. So this is projects by uh, Philippe Stark. If we did a poll, I'm sure you've all heard of him. They brand hotels after him. We do all of their US work. This is one of his first designs. So this is the A-level interior designer or architect, right? They're famous, everybody does it. You, If you look at you know, furniture companies, they pay him millions of dollars to put his name on a chair and design a chair. So these are a series of sushi bars that we've done with him. But if you really look at it, it's nothing that's that unusual, but it's the exquisite detailing, okay? If you notice the lights are bevel cut into the wood, so all of the guts are up above the ceiling, but you don't even have a trim on the ceilings. These transparencies are all rear illuminated. So they're basically, you're surrounded by brightness. Um, so what's really important to us though, is the functional lighting. Look how we can get the light down onto the table so you can read your menus, you can see the food, you get the soft glow on everybody's faces. But even where the logo is, which is above the basically the hood, our light is way back here and it's tucked in the air, con shift, air conditioning shaft. Okay, so we think about where do we want the light to go or to be, and then we worry about how do we hide the fixture and then we pick the fixture. Too many times people start off with, what's the light fixture I want to use? And it's really more about what do you want a light? Light, what's important? So this is one project they did with them. Okay, that was successful. Then he came up with us. This is a bar, okay? Remember, we live in Los Angeles. He says, I want to turn this, turn table lamps upside down and hang them. And I'm like, okay, you're on drugs, but you know, he's our boss, so we got to figure out how to do it. And remember, we have earthquakes, so these things want to swing around and we have UL approval. So while this is the inspiration, we have to work it on it from a technical standpoint. So this is a kind of a nightclub and up in the ceiling, it's hard to see. We have all these theatrical lights that can make this into a dance floor if you kind of want to do that. Or this project, you know, he took a very simple fixture and just clustered them and hung a hundred of them from a the ceiling or the outside of the building, put these little fins or waves because it's in Miami. So we tried to take the lead and say at the end of each one of these points, let's put a little nautical blue dot and kind of create these waves of light going up the building. So that's someone really known as being the epitome of designers, but going back to these, you're just as creative, okay? You just don't have the amount of experience or exposure. So when anybody thinks, oh, I'm too engineering, I'm too numbers or too analytical, that's bull. Anybody can do this. You just have to be good and have the desire and you continually work to craft your um, skills. So this was a diagram and I love these little Venn diagrams, but it was talking about lighting quality. And you may have think about these, you may not, but it also shows different ways lighting can lead your career. There's two groups here, the IALD and the IES, Illuminating Engineering Society of North America and the International Association of Lighting Designers. And what they said is lighting comes down into a couple different buckets. And one is economics, okay? How much does it cost? How efficiently can I operate it? How little impact on the environment? So that's this one circle. Then you have the Philippe Stark. Oh, it's all about design and creating form and composition, but it's also about integrating codes and maybe even daylighting. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's this whole new thing. It's about the visual needs. And we'll talk about health and well being of lighting. But can you see, can this lighting make you feel good or at least not make you feel bad? Okay. Or does it make you want to? get into a space and stay, 
or if it's a fast food restaurant, you want to get in and hopefully get out really quick. But what we want to do is be at this juncture. And I'm not saying dead center. You might have something that's a little bit cheaper installation. You might have something that's a little bit more artistic, or you might have something that's fully about the human needs. As a designer, you have to consider all of these elements and come up with a design that's unique to your project. So you can go onto these guys' website and you can find a lot of information about this, um, but just things to consider. But now as a young practitioner, these are all potential future jobs for you, okay? It's a lot more than shoving a fluorescent two by four in a ceiling and lighting up someone's corridor, okay? And a lot of these things weren't even known about when I was a student, that's what's so great about lighting. It moves a lot quicker. We still build buildings pretty much the same way we did 200 years ago, but the lighting technology and even what we found out about the eye has changed so much, even in the last 10 to 20 years, it's incredible. And that's what's great. That's what's gonna make you very valid and usable resource for your company and for the outside industries. So where can you work? What types of projects? Do any of these things you know, have any interest to you? Now, there are some lighting consultants, all they do is custom houses. And if you like dealing with rich people, and trust us, we've done many of the stars and producers and they're all jerks. No, I shouldn't say it that way, but the reality is they have lots of egos, they have lots of money. You end up spending more time being a psychologist, I think, than you do a lighting designer. Maybe you wanna get into entertainment, doing spaces, that literally you know, can transform and be one way during the day in a totally different way at nighttime. Maybe you love sports. You can get into a company that does giant arenas for football stadiums, which were once functional spaces. But if you look at Dallas and now Los Angeles, they're becoming works of art themselves. Maybe it's outdoors, landscape lighting, creating spaces that people can use at nighttime especially in Florida, in the Bahamas, in California, spaces with good weather, we stay out outside a lot and huge impact now with COVID, right? Because we have these outdoor spaces when they closed down interior dining, it was very simple for some of our um, clients to shift gears and to stay in business during this past year. So all these are potential elements and I never thought about it, but every space that you go in there has lighting, maybe not done well, okay, but the reality of it is it needs the lighting to be done well. Here's a couple of some of our projects just to show you um, if anybody's ever flown into um, Los Angeles, these pylons that change colors, it created an artistic gateway into Los Angeles, but also the importance of lighting up signage lighting up the palm trees. Why? People come to California, they expect to see palm trees. We wanna make sure that we deliver upon that and people can really see it. And we'd like to say lighting is the art and the science. You can believe that or not, but this is an underpass in Qatar. Okay, normally what do they do? Think of how many underpasses you better. They put a big bright light up on the ceiling, call it a day. Well, we didn't want to do this. If you look at the architecture, it's very sculptural. And we really think the lighting should respect that. And we look at it now, we have traffic. Some of it is going this direction on this side, the opposite direction. They do the same as you know, the US traffic. Um, some countries are different than that. Um, but what we try to do, and, and actually Qatar, while you may think it's not that developed or they just have a lot of oil money and stuff, it's a very progressive country and they have very strict illumination laws, at least for underpasses, where they wanted almost perfectly even illumination on the, the ground or the work plane. Well, that's great. So instead of putting a glare bomb, which is this big bright light that basically is offensive and you need, I'm gonna call it sunglasses to even look at it, we decided how do we express the form, but how do we do it in the best visual impact for drivers? So our functional light is a linear white light, but it's asymmetric. What do I mean by that? It kicks light down, but it also kicks light on an angle. So when we drive on this side, the light is pointed to your bumper. Why do we do that? It gets the light on the 
ground, but it doesn't shoot light into your eyes. When you come the other way, the lights are oriented towards us, or once again, towards the rear bumper of those cars. Okay, that's great. We got perfectly illuminated light levels in here, and we did all calcs to do that, but it's still a boring space. It doesn't respect the architecture. And so these are heavily civil, civil engineering projects. And we said, okay, we want to highlight the rib. So we want to go in and cut a hole right in the wall to hide our light fixture. And you can imagine the structural engineer, oh my God, that's right where all the weight comes down. Well, we say, yes, we understand that. Well, let's just offset it. And you'll be able to communicate with these people anywhere around the world because of this very I'm going to call it general knowledge of all of the building sciences. And then we have a K rail or the Jersey barriers or the crash protection. And these are solid, poured solid concrete. We said, we want to hollow that out and put lights that can uplight the ribs. And they're like, oh, you can't do that. Drivers will look down into it. Well, we did studies to show, okay, it's low enough, a car will never see it. Okay, a truck or a bus might look down. So we had to put louvers to block the view of the light. And even putting light in between these things, you can start to see one that kind of does a soft light up in there. All these lights were important to us and we had to be convicted to our design so that we could go in there and confidently tell the engineer, you have to make provisions for us. So the number one thing, just like Dyson never gave up, don't give up on your designs. When they say no, figure out a way to do it. And because it's in Qatar, this is what the architect wanted, very stately. Well, we actually have the ability, not for the driveway lighting, the linear lights that light the roadway, but for the, the ribs and the structure, we can actually modify it and change colors of it. And they're tied together to the speed of the traffic throughout there. So whoever thought that a simple underpass could be so complicated, um, but to us, that's what we love doing. Yes, we could have put one light in the middle of each bay, gotten paid and gone away. But at the end of the day, we have an award-winning project that we're proud of and leads to future jobs down the road. And that's what's really important as you grow your career. I mentioned calculations. We do a lot of them, but we probably do a lot less than you think. In a hotel, we do very little calculations. Maybe we do the meeting rooms. Maybe we do the drop-off area to make sure nobody trips off of the curb. How much light is in a restaurant? I don't care. If I light the faces, the food, and the walls, the space will feel bright and I can create the drama in there. In this case, we're looking at glare studies. It's an airport concourse, and we want to make sure that the window and daylighting is great, right, to get all this free light in these spaces but we have to make sure we don't blind the poor ticket taker person, the flight attendant over here so that the light comes through and becomes a glare issue for them. And you'll learn about veiling reflections and all these other technical things. Remember, good light can wash out bad light, but this is why we really need students like yourself because you're really good at doing things like this. And I can imagine what it can do and I can predict, but this is some of the tools that help sell the design to the architect of why we might have to put filtering curtains, fretted glass, frosted glass on the west facade. So when the sun set, it doesn't blind everybody coming through here. Hopefully they would have oriented the building correctly, but many times you're stuck by the physics of your site. So hopefully this is making sense. So we've gone through a little bit about creativity and designers and Legos and stuff. So Jay, do you want to answer the next or do the next poll? Because I think we skipped over this one a little bit. Just making sure everybody's asleep there, or I'm sorry, awake there, but it gives me a chance to drink. Okay. That's great. I'm really glad to see it because, you know, once again, you know, sometimes when you're in an engineering profession, you're kind of shoehorned into less of these creative solutions and things. So that's great. Let's get rid of that. Thank you for answering. And I'm glad to see such high numbers. And I didn't make up that theater question. Jay added it in there. So just so you know. So. Okay. You know, this is a bridge. And why is this important? Well, you could be the structural designer. You could be the lighting designer. 
but our lights have to last 125 years. That's the life cycle that Caltrans requires for us. And the idea is that we could say, well, this horizontal line represents the ocean behind us. And these catenary lights represent the mountains. Yes, LA does have mountains just north and east of the city so that you come up with a storyline of how to help sell this design. But at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of simple dots, but yet everybody is attracted to the why and the story of what we did it. Gives you an explanation. And we've been able to do great projects like the Olympics. The last time it was in um, Atlanta, and we're hoping to do a lot for the ones coming here in Los Angeles, but working with great architects like TVS to create these pylons that anchor Centennial Olympic Park um, and working with the vendor who gave or donated all the lights and they had to use their poles. Well, they had pretty ugly light fixtures. So we had to come up with this quilt or layers of light. So we have tall poles and general down lights. Why? That way they could set up tents in the middle of the fields, but we also wanted the space to be safe and also usable by the city of Atlanta well after the Olympics have packed up and gone away. So we have the tallest layer, this mid layer, then the lower pedestrian scaled layer as you get towards the inside. And then finally, uplighting trees in the fountains themselves. So it's not just about picking a pole and you're done. There has to be a reason of what and why you want it in all of these spaces. Different type of park, different type of effect. So really putting the emphasis on landscape lighting, but more putting two linear rows of poles a lot smaller so they integrated into the trees but we can kind of shoot the lights just like in a museum where you aim the lights on the artwork where you need it. The same thing was done here, but also taking advantage of architecture, bouncing lights, creating lanterns that help light the surroundings. And then obviously the play pools, both for kids, but also this element. So it anchor city hall here. The fountain is one of the key points just behind or to the right of this is um, our theaters, our district, the new Disney Symphony Hall and the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. So it becomes a great space. And this is where we have protests lately, but more importantly, we have New Year's Eve celebrations. So you're creating spaces for people to use. More importantly, it's about vertical illumination. This is the first park and it's on the strip in Las Vegas. I don't know if anybody's been there a very anal client. They're like, I don't care what you do. I just don't want to see any light fixtures. So we had to build all the lights into these fountains. And these fountains are great because Vegas is really hot. Nobody can walk through without touching these fountains. Okay. It becomes very, very tactile. And the idea is that we took a Burning Man sculpture. I don't know if you've ever heard about Burning Man. It's real popular on the West. It's where all the drug people go out in the middle of the desert and they look at artwork and things. So um, if you're familiar with it, it's, it's kind of very I'm not cool enough to go, but you guys probably are. But anyway, we took one of their sculptures, brought it here. And even these shade structures in the background, I had to go to Holland, the Netherlands, because the only person that could build these were shipbuilders that could bend metal like the bowels. And we did a mock-up there. We literally shipped lights there and we installed them. And we said, yes, this is going to work. The owners were there. So, you know, once again, you never know where your creel is going to work, but we did tons of mock-up on this water. That's why it's really magical when you walk through here. But notice there's no light poles. It feels safe, okay? Why? Because you get the light bouncing off of these vertical surface. Most important thing is you see vertical walls, you don't see the floor, okay? That's why whether it's inside or outside, you always want to light the walls. So that's another one of your life lessons, just like people are moths. This is inside. Think about these typical, very generic spaces, but now they're becoming very artistic. It's a water park. We can create very dramatic elements by lighting waterfalls, taking lights, not only lighting the space, but highlighting the architecture, the flowers. Bottom line is it's really simple. And I don't wanna share this secret because you'll steal it, but it's really important. So light what you want to see. Oh my God, isn't that brilliant? Okay, but think about it. If you highlight it and it's brighter than the surroundings, people will notice it. So how do you do that as a designer? Look where the architect or the interior designer is spending money. When they're buying a really expensive gold leaf tile, 
that's probably really important. When it's a focal wall, that's really important. Take the cues from the rest of the design team and really emphasize your lighting or maybe your lighting budget so you can afford to really highlight those important elements. Okay. And, you know, projects are grand scale. This is the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi, which is not your typical, you know, project. Why? Because, you know, the royal family actually has the top floors and they have a big problem. How do they attract doctors that want to go from Chicago and Seattle, get them to relocate um, in Abu Dhabi with their family? So they give them housing, but more importantly, they give them a state of the art facility. It's almost like literally a mall through the middle of it. It's almost like a hotel for sick people. And a lot of their procedures are elective too. So they may not even be that sick. The other end of the spectrum, projects can be really inexpensive. Look at the importance of this rainbow effect on the corner of the building. Why is this important? Well, first of all, you could have parents bringing their sick children here and they're in a panic stage. They're trying to find the hospital. They've never been there. They're trying to get to the emergency room. So this is iconic on the skyline. People know where it is. They're intuitively drawn to it. But more importantly, you also have children that are coming back for reoccurring chemotherapy and you're creating a little bit of fun that they can relate to. Now our lighting, the Port Cacher is always the brightest. You can see the drop off area, why? People are moss, they're attracted to that area. We wanna make sure that no one gets run over by a car, but the lighting doesn't have to cost a lot. This was done with a fluorescent strip light and a color filter. Now it could be done with color changing lighting. So some people may think lighting designs are really expensive. No, we're just using our lighting dollars very practical in many of our projects, especially today. Big spaces, you know, how do you make a space that can be set up for literally 10,000 people or 50,000 people, but also kind of make it intimate with tables and chairs and hot weather where you can go outside and get in the shade of the trees, but also create almost an art, art type of application and different zones. So we're intentionally almost creating different living rooms. Even though this building is almost a half a mile long, it feels very different when you're in these spaces. And lighting is one of those key elements, especially after the sun goes down to bring those together. Another convention center, obviously, but look at the moods. You guys have probably gone into a convention center, I don't know, maybe for a car or boat show or maybe for a trade show, okay? And they feel like big boxes. Well, not anymore. I mean, these things feel like ballrooms. They have breakout out out areas that feel like your living rooms or high-end restaurants. Why? It's all about money. They can rent these spaces out um, to different companies and host the events rather than having people go off-site. And as a creative designer, it's going to you're going to be called upon how to create these looks and feels, but the ability to crank the lights way up so you can have a normal type of trade show within those spaces. And this is an urban school. It's actually called the urban school. But you know, the lighting is really double effects. One is practical interior lighting. Just by bouncing light off the ceiling, it kind of makes the architectural cube transparent. But intentionally, because of the brutalist type of architecture, we graze down the board formed concrete. It brings out the texture, the nooks and the crannies. Uh, it's almost like a prison yard. Why? We really wanted to emphasize what the architect and the landscape architect was trying to do with this brutalist statement um, on the ground plane. So, you know, it's almost like this is a fortress, but then come in through the inviting entrance and you can learn um, in the classrooms and in the library type of setting. So your lighting should take the cues from your architecture. But maybe it's about full integration. If you look at this, this is down in San Diego, so great weather all the time. So um, working with the architect, we were able to get a lot of daylight in the space. These are all skylight wells. But more importantly, during the daytime, the skylight comes in and it washes the shafts or the sides of the wall, which is great. It moves around during the daytime. It's dynamic. It changes colors. All that is awesome. But look at our lighting it's tucked way up in there. And if I didn't point it out, you probably wouldn't have noticed it. Why? In nighttime, we're creating the same type of effect. 
The lighting shoots down to the ground where we need it, and the tables and chairs are always moving around, but it also lights these skylight shafts. Where we need more lighting is maybe over the servery counter, and we build lighting into the architecture. But what we'd like to say, through the integration of lighting, our best lighting is when you don't notice it. That's pretty weird. You know, normally we should be selling how great our lighting looks. We really think, I'll say it again, our best lighting is when you don't notice it. Hopefully that makes sense. So. And I think things are becoming more creative. LEDs have given us fixtures. Before we had a four foot long tube of light, now we can do little things, create all different types of effects. We can even have acoustical properties to our light fixtures now. But the limitation is your creativity. Yes, we have to meet requirements of how much light needs to be in these spaces, but everything can work within your design palette. So here's kind of another life lesson. So everybody get your pens out and stuff. Probably the best thing that you can ever do, and I see some of the uh, faces that were involved with mentoring um, throughout here, is to volunteer. And you've, you guys have heard me say this, whether it's through philanthropic elements, whether or not it's your church, or whether or not you want to hand out you know, food to the homeless, but also when you're at work, get involved with those. And by work, I mean, when you have your full-time employment or even as a summer internship. I think the most important thing is while you're working, someone else is gonna go to a site visit, raise your hand, volunteer, go out with them. Um, you might not get paid, but you'll probably get a cheeseburger at the end of the night or whatever. Remember lighting gets done after dark many times, okay? You're gonna learn more in that site visit than you will in the previous two weeks of work. I guarantee that. Get involved in the professional society. Why? It looks good on your resume, right? You all want to get a good job someday. But these organizations also give sponsorship. They'll send you to conventions and to annual conferences. And that's how you're really going to network, meet all of these other people, um, as well as learn from those things. And that adds to the community. The lighting community and the design com community is actually very small very tightly networked. We all know each other and we all work hard and support each other, unlike some of the cutthroat businesses where it's all about competition. So by volunteering, you'll get exposed to that. So these are some of our, our people. You know, what's great, you get out onto these job sites, you hang off the top of a 400 story building. I've been on top of a 75 story building. You're commissioning light fixtures, setting dimmers, okay? You're in a tunnel underneath a runway, creating an art installations. And there's always cool things. You get to write your name on the last beam that goes up and it's there forever. We had another job where they took all of our pictures, they put them in a mural. When you drive in the um, car park, all of our faces are on there. So, you know, you're there to greet everybody because of the hard work that you do. But more importantly, you get to see the world and you get some exposure that you don't get when you're tied to a desk. Um, and this is not construction management. This is a part of a design job where yes, we do the design, but we go out there to the job to focus the lights, to work with the contractor, to make sure they've done it correctly. A couple more pictures. This is an old Frank Lloyd Wright house. This is that 9 million square foot building in India. This is us replicating the Eiffel Tower in China, um, world's largest passenger elevator. I mean, this is us, all of our staff, you know, there's Laura going up, you know, men, women, it doesn't matter. But what I would say from a female standpoint, know your crap, okay? And we have Lindsay. Lindsay is blonde hair, she's five foot tall. Contractors will say, your light fixture doesn't work. And she'll say, that's interesting. She'll grab the ladder herself. She'll pull it over there. She runs up the ladder. She goes, oh, you mean like this? She fixes it. And then the contractors are like, oh, crap and stuff. So you need to know your stuff because the contractors rarely want to do any work. Okay. They want to get done, get paid and get off the job. We want to make sure we don't leave until it's perfect at the end of the day. So at the end of the cycle, you tend to go in there and do punch lists and corrections, things the contractor has to do. And once again, they have the financial incentive to get lost and get off the job. But at the same time, you're trying to make it a better space for your client so that you get great pictures. You can get rewarded with new jobs down the road. To us, the culture of your um, 
place where you may work is really important to us. So we feel that while we have to run it like a business, we're all a family here. So this is, you know, our company here. We do walks to raise money. This is the peer-to-peer -peer walk um, up in Hermosa Beach. Every year we do a food drive um, for Thanksgiving. Um, this is can construction where we team up with a big architect. We buy all this food, we get reps to help buy it and stuff. And then we create um, literally structural works of art out of cans. And then when we're all done, the community votes and this got a national structural award for this design. We've been in volunteering with Habitat for Humanity. Um, this is just this year. The pandemic has created a huge issue with homelessness, especially on the West Coast. We have good weather. Everybody shows up here. We're purchasing sleeping bags, things, um, you know, things that you take for granted, toothpaste, um, handy wipes, those things. We assemble them into backpacks and we take it and donate it to shelters. So we've done this multiple times and we hope that we don't have to, but we have a feeling that we'll continue to do it at this point and things. So to us, we're part of a bigger community, the city of Long Beach in California, but we always want to make sure that we give back. And that can be whether it's Penn State, whether or not it's the lighting community or your community, I would say get back. And the real reason why, and I hear this said all the time, whatever you invest in time, you'll get back a multiple of five times. You'll get more back than you put in. And that's all I can say. You probably don't believe me now, but in 10 years, you're going to remember this conversation. Say, thank God I got involved with this. So, okay. So what are the rewards? Okay. We talked about this, the connection the support, okay, because especially in these professional society, our competitors we deal with, we support each other, we share technology. You're gonna learn more, get to be able to do your job better by additional knowledge. And you know what, cash, okay? The more you have these connections, the more knowledge you have, the more you demand as an employee to employers, okay? This is all important, so I'm not saying do this volunteerism because you're gonna get more cash. I think that's a great side benefit. It's the emotional awards that you get out of it. So um, once again, in 10 years, give me a call and tell me if I was right or wrong. So. Things have changed drastically, okay? This is obviously, you know, the 60s. We would illuminate offices. I wasn't around in the 60s, okay? Or I wasn't designing, I should say. But, you know, the light levels were three to 500 foot candles. Why? Well basically because the people that wrote the codes sold light fixtures. The higher the light levels, the higher the number of fixtures you would need, the more light bulbs you would need per fixture. But we also had different tasks. They were drafting, they're doing pencil on paper. That's very hard to read versus now everybody uses pens on paper so you get much more contrast or everybody's working on computer screens so we don't need as much light but as we drop the amount of light needed to see how much light do you need to feel good probably the most important thing is look at how the desks are oriented they're getting natural light there's this 20 20 20 rule for you know 20 minutes of staring you need to look away 20 feet for 20 seconds okay same thing they have a view Incredible. So what you're doing while people may say, well, that's going to be destructive or it's going to be less productive for the people. It's actually better for them because now we're looking at how can light, how can light make people feel better? Then we had the energy crisis that was in the 80s while I was at Penn State. You guys probably weren't born yet and stuff. What did they do? They came back, same types of spaces. They took out every other light fixture or unscrewed the light bulb. And all of a sudden now we could live with half as much light and still see just as well. Why your eye can accommodate, your pupils get bigger, allow more light in, all the stuff that you guys will learn about. Then what happened? The CRT, cathode ray tube. Can you imagine these things being on your desk? You guys all got your laptops now. These things were heavy. They were boat anchors. But worse than that, they had glossy screens and they were curved. So in the corners, you got a lot of glare from the light fixtures. Now, all of a sudden in the 80s and 90s, people were thinking about lighting because why? Because they had computers in the spaces and they couldn't read the computer screens. It's a lot different than your iPads now that you can just tilt and solve the problem. 
So many times people never thought about lighting as design. It was more about how do I solve these problems in these real spaces? And things have changed a little bit later. So how to get rid of glare, how to feel better, how to open up the space visually, maybe indirect lighting, pendant lights that shoot up. And our light levels, our target light levels are much lower. But what's really happening in these photographs, notice how the light far away from the window is turned on and the one closest is turned off. Why? Controls. They're basically saying they're reading that there's enough daylight in the space that I don't have to turn on my electric light. So you need to talk, to communicate, to educate how we need to orient the buildings, how we have to get natural light in without glare so we can turn the lights off whenever possible and then supplement them in the rest of the spaces. So just in my lifetime, I've seen this drastic level of using one-tenth the amount of light that we had, and more importantly, working to turn it off totally. The newest big thing, and this is something that might really interest you, and we see people that are coming to lighting as a second career, people that happen to maybe be nurses before, healthcare professionals, the health and well-being of lighting. Everybody's seen this. If you're not familiar, it's called the circadian rhythm of lighting. When the light comes up, it's very warm. As it gets higher in the sky, it gets brighter. It gets whiter, crisper. Um, it's called color temperature. Nerdy things is. Bottom line is your body has learned over the last 100,000 years how to process this light, and our bodies have adapted to it. So shouldn't our electric lighting do the same thing? At the end of the day, you should have dim, warm light, OK? How many people have an iPhone? And about two years ago, well, I forget COVID, that didn't count, but basically three years ago, the American Medical Association came out with a statement that cold blue LED street lighting could be harmful to your health. Oh my God, what is the AMA talking about lighting design, okay? And it put the whole world on notice that that cool light from the street lights could be affecting your sleeping or disrupting your circadian rhythm sequence. So all of a sudden municipalities scrambled. How do I get warm lighting? Well, what did Apple do? Do you remember when they went to a nighttime setting and it got dimmer, but it also got warmer in tone? They're covering their butts. They don't want somebody to come back and say, well, the AMA said cool blue lighting is bad for you at nighttime. But take that to your own. You know, what is the color of your digital clock in your room? Is it red? Maybe that's good. Is it blue? Why would a hotel ever buy blue digital clocks? Okay. Um, same thing. What's the worst thing that you do at nighttime? Probably watch TV or look at your computer screen. That's bad. It can disrupt this. So it's really about how can we use electric lighting or more importantly, the introduction of natural lighting to reinforce this cycle. This is brand new. This is all in the last five years. So people are studying it, researching it. People are teaching it. Um, so if you're interested in this, it's a whole new thing. So it's not about you know sports lighting. It's really about lighting for people's health. But we're taking into those things. And a lot of it was common sense and a lot of things that were, we were already doing. This is Beats by Dr. Dre. You know, How can we do clear story light bounce natural light in so that we fill these volumes with the, the light. But even at nighttime, doing electric light that does the same thing, bounce things in and having a variety of light. So it feels different with some table lamps over here, pendants over here, big open spaces over here. What's right or wrong? It's what's appropriate for your spaces. Something a little bit more refined, a lawyer's office. Yeah, they can have fun with decorative fixtures, but you got to make sure you light the stairs probably with architectural lights so that no one trips and falls and you get sued. But remember, it's about lighting the walls, the surfaces. They can have linear lights. They can have indirect type of lighting. The solution is unlimited with what you can come up with. Or what we call we work space. This is one was called workspace innovation labs. It's almost like you got to have 10 of everything going on in the spaces. Why? Because people get bored and they want to move around, um, whether it's working at a ping pong table or at a traditional desk setup. The lighting needs to be flexible and usually controlled so you can dial in the intensity that you want in the spaces. So here's your test. You're not going to get um, a quiz on this, but what is the most efficient light source? 
and I'll share it with you. It's the one you turn off, okay? Something that wasn't even discussed a long time ago. But I know 80% of you guys are bored and not going to go into lighting design, but no matter what you do, think about this. What is the business cycle? So I'm going to say in a typical job, you need to market to get the job. Okay, well, then hopefully you go to work. None of you are going to start a company from day one. You don't have the experience or the expertise, and you don't want to make the mistakes yourself because you have to pay to correct those mistakes. So you want to go to a firm where you can be part of the culture and you can get mentored and learn a lot. And you're going to get involved in the marketing, how to find out about jobs, how to get the jobs. And how do you get it? Well, first of all, you find out about it, then you put a bid in. In other words, you say, I'm going to charge you X dollars to do this project. And then you celebrate. You got this job. Okay, it's a $100,000 fee. It's going to last you two years or part-time over two years. Then you have to do the design. And then you're like, oh, crap, I only have $100,000 to get this job done. You have to be efficient on how you do it. And you want to do all those things we saw in that three-circle diagram. You want to consider all of these options come up with the appropriate design solution, and then you have to produce it. You have to document it, okay? Good documents so your client doesn't pay a premium through back charges. Um, you produce it, you finish the job, and then you have to collect your fees. And that's always a problem, right? I went to design school. I want to become a designer. I don't want to become an accountant. Well, if you don't get paid, you don't take home money or you can't pay your staff. But once the job's over, you collect the money, you're really happy. But then you take that expertise, that experience, now you can go market to get the next job. And it's just this big continuous cycle. And the more experience you get, the more you can market, the bigger your circle is. And you might start off at a little firm or a 10,000 person firm, but this is the same role that happens. So kind of remember this. So by understanding this, you'll understand what your role is in how you can make yourself more valuable to the company you work in. Back to lighting, okay? We talk about high-rise building, lighting the crown. Why you see that five miles away? Light the pedestrian zone, the ground floor, the podium, why? That's what people experience by car or by foot as they enter the building. And then we like the transition zone so that we just don't have a floating crown on the top of the building. We're visually tying it to the bottom and examples of how that can be done. So to us, we've come up with logic, recipes of what work, even though the architecture is different every time and the solutions are different, but there are certain things that we know that work. How do you know? Go out and to look, create those slides. Look at high-rise buildings, for example, that really work, that get your attention. What have they done right? Why does this one look so bad over there? You can become an expert just by paying attention. In some examples, this is an IN pay tower. You know, it was the tallest building at one point in Los Angeles. As you get the crown, it's visually tied. We could not floodlight the bottom portion because there's no way physically to do it. And then even it's the entrance. How do you come in and reinforce this I'm going to call it circular design of the building. Well, the lighting should reinforce that. The newest tallest building on the West Coast, Wilshire Grand, where we got involved in EIRs, environmental impact reports, a study that says this building will not be offensive to the neighbors around it, okay? We probably got paid $50,000 to meet with lawyers and to do studies on it. Then we got to design the building and our fee wasn't a lot more than our design standards, but we've created something that becomes iconic. Now notice in the background, there's another building. I did this building in 1987. It's done with fluorescent strip lights behind a wall. So in other words, you look through glass and you just see a drywall wall. It's the cheapest design I've ever done. The whole thing costs less than probably $2,000. This 30 years later is just as impactful as this. And in fact, every night our news helicopters for our evening news showcase this building or this building or the building I just showed you. So the lightings don't have to flink, flash, blink and be obnoxious. They can be very architecturally integrated and not expensive. 
In this case, it's a project in China. We asked the clients, the chairman, what's the most important thing? He said his sign. And we're like, oh, crap, because we like to light the top of the building. So we let the crown go dark so the sign could be bright. Why? because a bright sign on a dark background is really noticeable. If you have a bright sign on a bright background, you don't really notice it. Then we did a simple drapery pocket, put a light in it. That becomes the facade lighting at nighttime, but it also becomes the interior security lighting. And then when you come down to the lowest level, we have a lot of digital signs that wrap around to create a lot of excitement for the pedestrians. Or it's integrating lights into spandrel glass, creating what we call the zipper of light very restraint, very corporate light interiors, okay? You know, whether it's a bank or an energy company, these are all attractive spaces for potential tenants. This is what sells the building. When a developer can lease out his building, he gets money, then they can go build another building. Or a similar type of design, glass is tough. Light hits glass and bounces away. So how do you incorporate it? How do you bring, this is downtown Denver, you know, a lot of very um, green or ecological people, the warmth of wood where the LA ones are maybe glass and steel. This is really about the warmth of natural materials, how to express it. We're doing unique things because the walls can't out to uplight it from the floor. Stuff they don't teach about in school, but they're all legal and they all work. And this really isn't me. This is my bobblehead on another body. But, you know, this is the IES handbook. And obviously, it's been expanded. It's not really that thick and stuff. But lighting design is not calculations. And we have a designer. If they're new, we get a lot of students from Penn State, from um, Colorado, all trained in AE. We also have people from interior programs, architecture programs, landscape programs. But if they go to a technical manual as their first step of the design, we come up and slap them on the back of the head. Well, we don't do that because we'll get sued. But the reality is we want you to close your eyes, imagine what you want this space to feel like. How do you want to direct the people? Where and what do you want to light? And then come back and use a calculation to confirm that you meet these codes. Don't start with the codes because that'll put your blinders on you and really limit what you can do for the rest of your spaces. So anyway. You can tell all your teachers, I said, don't look at the IES manual. It's not the way to do it. But remember, I didn't really say that. I said, do it as your follow-up. Um, where do you get your inspiration on design? And this was my hardest part. Well, it can be from nature. It could be the site. You know, Is this located in the Amazon forest or center city? Is it the culture? We do a lot in China. They tend to like brighter, sometimes whiter or cooler color temperatures. If it's Disney, it's all about the storyline, the timeline, the image that you're trying to do. Some people just want to do something that's cool, that's never been done before or try to copy it. And it really comes up to you. And you could say, I remember seeing something like this and how important the shadows are from the trees. And you'll hear a lot of lighting designers talk about how they paint with shadows and it's just creating terms like sparkle and glare, things that John Flynn, a former Penn State professor shared about ways to articulate lighting. But this is how the sun does it every day. This is maybe how you could do it using gobo patterns and theatrical projectors to create something else that's a lot more exciting than just general lighting on stairs. How do you sell your designs, okay? And when sales, oh, that sounds like it's a slimy word, but you know what? You could be the best designer, but if you cannot communicate to your clients, good luck, okay? So that means both using digital format, in this case, renderings, um, as well as talking to people. And I get it, your generation, I know I sound like the old fart again, but everybody loves sending text messages and emails. I spend more time telling my staff, pick up the phone and call somebody. You'll understand them better. You don't read in between the sentences. You don't, you can't hear the inflection in their tones. So in this case, this is a rendering that our staff did. And, you know, here's how we break down the lighting. It's an indoor outdoor space. It's in the Bahamas. We have indirect light that lights up the ceiling, gives us soft ambient light indirect lights that wash up the louvers, giant chandeliers that glow softly, 
don't give much light, but they give scale, they give form. A narrow beam up light that grazes up the textured stone to really bring out the texture. The importance of the fountains, both color changing in the middle, the soft, warm glow, reinforcing that hospitality feel. Then probably the most important thing, the illumination of the landscaping to bring the outside in. This is what the real photograph looks like. Incredibly similar. Yes, the chandeliers are now steel versus shells. Okay, and that's part of the budget issues, but look, they're dimmed way down. And this is how you learn about lighting, going out there, focusing. And we do a tremendous amount of mock-ups where we take lights out and turn them on to see how they will look and feel in the spaces. Okay, different types of projects. So, you know, this is in Macau, a different view. This is looking up at the ceiling, but once again, you can tell some of the statements that I said, like light what you want to see. In this case, lighting up the greenery in the ceiling, lighting up the very um, organic desk and back wall, creating functional lighting in the rest of the spaces. I'll go a little bit quicker through some of these. Um, this is a casino at an airport, okay? The people of Korea cannot even go to it, but outsiders can. So we want lighting that is noticeable but doesn't cause airplanes to crash, okay? Um, obviously, so it has to be recognizable, but building lighting, whether or not it's to highlight the different features, putting lights close to columns to graze up them, not only does it bring out the rhythm of the columns, but it keeps from shining lights into the guest room's windows. We don't wanna create that glare. And while this is the formal entry, on the backside, there's a giant pool and it becomes one of this giant, I'm gonna call it great experiences where you can be outside and you can swim, play, um, have everything from very romantic dark areas to very bright active areas. So lighting is incredibly important to really create that last layer um, in the spaces. You know, coming back, looking at the features, the up light on the top of the building, the sconces on the column, everything, the brightest thing is the port cachere, lighting up the landscaping. These are all elements that you'll build on your designs as you get more and more familiar with your clients and the type of clientele they're trying to attract. Said so this multiple times, light what you want to see. So look at this lobby. Now you can say, this is pretty glitzy. Well, this is Shanghai, okay? It's about crystal, it's about contrast, polished black granite highly polished bronze, you know, the idea, so when there's a feature like this screen, there's a row of lights that can highlight it. Um, the giant chandelier uplighting the gold leaf. Once again, the registration desk is always the brightest thing. And using new technologies, this can be fiber optics over the spa so that you can dim down the cove and the down lights and have something that is very, very relaxing in the spa or even the banquette. Weddings are huge businesses. It's all about money. So we can have bright lights, we can change the colors, but we can have our down lights be very wide beam or they can be very narrow and just light the desk or the center of a table. And they're done with robotics. Something that didn't exist 10 years ago, we can change the focus of light and the aiming of light with an iPad. So now your lighting can be interactive and functional. What does it do? It eliminates having to bring out ladders or lifts to aim the lights the way you need them. All these are great tools. And I can foresee sometime in my lifetime, let alone yours, that you can put a sensor on a table. And when you move the table, the light will follow it. That way, if you're bald, you don't have the light hitting the top of your head or something else. So put the light where you need it. It can be very architectural, very integrated. And notice, I'm trying to just share with you how diverse the projects are that you are working on. Probably every um, homework assignment you're gonna have is a three-dimensional box, right? Flat roof, flat walls, flat ceiling, maybe an arch ceiling or something. Notice how different all of these different spaces are and things, and that's what's the beauty. You have to be able to translate two-dimensional drawings into three-dimensional space. And you know, you're gonna be living and working in Revit, which is three-dimensional, but you really have to be able to take the scale of these spaces and relate them um, to true spaces. So, is this good or bad lighting? Okay, this was done, once again, this is the second phase of Bargada called the Water Club. We went through all these studies that show that floodlighting the facade, even though there's a lot of glass that the light bounces off of, 
was the most cost-effective solution to light this building. And we did great jobs. The pools change colors. Why? So they rent these spaces out so they can have, you know, wild parties up here. But times have changed. A lot of people now worried about all the light that hits this glass that bogs us to the sky. Is that responsible lighting? Could we have done it a better, different way? Possibly. And it's your job to educate the client and say, this isn't good because birds are going to get disoriented when they fly around. And the client may say, I don't care. I don't care about birds. Or they may say, hey, you're right. What are some of our other solutions? So the whole lighting of the world and about the good and the bads of that, both for environmental aspects, light trespass, those types of things are huge issues these days where they weren't as important, let's say 20 years ago. This is the entrance. It's basically where you drive in. It's not like the typical hotel that you stay in. Why? They want to create an experience that's unique, that's memorable, so the people will continue back because there's a lot of competition. This is right at LAX, our airport. Um, SLS is another Philippe Stark project, but just doing soft flood lighting. Now this building flood lights much better. Just look how it kind of magically glows. Why? It's precast stone. That other building was mostly polished glass. So it took on a different effect. I pulled this slide just for you guys. Notice how there's no light in the ceiling. So a lot of times we do that, but sometimes we wanna create the mood, the look and the feel more with table lamps and low level type of lighting in these spaces. There is one down light right where the SLS is and that's what's highlighting this table. So we wanna get the drama, the importance of these spaces, but many times we wanna do it while minimizing the holes in the ceiling. And the look and feel, once again, another Nassau project. So maybe some of you guys have been to these things being on the East Coast. If you go far, far away, immense projects, you know, these are 5,000 room hotels, okay? The average hotel is 200 rooms. I mean, they're just immense. The gambling floors are about 200,000 square feet bigger than most of the casinos, or at least if you know some of the ones in um, throughout Pennsylvania are about 50,000 square feet. This was our first project in Macau, golden building, how we made it look golden at nighttime. Yes, we have color changing at the very, very top. We have laser shows. We do all this whiz bang. Well, our client for this job is right across the bay. He saw this one and said, find out who did this and hire them and then his response is, when you design my hotel, I want everybody in Macau to look across the bay, see my hotel, and then want to stay over here. So this is, once again, a five or six star hotel. To give you a sense, the ceiling on the inside is 60 feet tall. Okay, the bay between the two has oysters. So the ceiling's made out of fake oyster shells. So we had to put pearls in there and they change colors. This glass is four inches thick. It's cobalt black or cobalt blue glass. How much light comes through it? I don't have a clue. We had to get a piece of it and test. And that's how you come up with the vision, but then work to implement it. And maybe a little bit glitzier than what we would want, but you have to remember the designer that you, or the clientele that you're designing for. So while we call this very upscale, it did have a little bit of color changing, but very restrained, very warm, very spa-like in nature. This is a project for the same client. They love it, I hate it, okay? And if you remember in China, they had triplet pandas born. And these things are the rock stars. They have their own books, they have their own TV shows, okay? And it, while we did the real zoo where they're actually showcased in real life, this is almost like a cartoon set. And to me, this is loud, it's garish, it's awful, but everybody loves it, okay? It's almost like you're coming into and you're living as part of a cartoon set. And while I might not be comfortable or I may not say that this is what I would like to do as a design, we're not designing for ourselves. We're designing for the people that will attend these spaces. Always keep that in mind. I talked about mock-ups, really critical. And this is the best way you're gonna learn. Get lights and turn them on. A computer program will not give you everything that you kind of need to know. So notice how this rendering shows lighting up the inside of the windowsills. This one shows the opposite, lighting up the outside. Which one do you like? That's a decision for you. Which one did they go to? Well, it took doing mock-ups, showing what the light inside of a sill could look like, what it could look like 
on the outside. And this is Chris Bright and this is Jesse Rathod. These are two Penn State grads. Chris, which talking about volunteering, he worked here six months and he went to Macau for nine months and lived there on a job site. Okay, and we put a lot of faith in him, but he volunteered and he learned more in that time period than probably most of the designers that stayed here um, for multiple years. Jesse, I think this was his third week working here. We loaded them up, gave them the tools. I personally did not go out, okay? And most of the time I do go to these. I love getting dirty and love doing the hands-on. I wanted them to play in almost a laboratory type of environment because this was the greatest job possible. It's a historic retrofit job. It's a three-dimensional model. It's a giant mock-up. And they came by and they documented it. You can downlight these little details, architectural details that no one even knew were on the building or backlighting louvers are probably the most important thing. These are bronze doors and a great marble surround. They put an uplight at them and they grazed up the marble and it highlights the transom, but it also brings out all the texture. This is what sold the client. Can you imagine going to a client now, you know, this is the elevator. It's a big shaft. We know that there's a beam going across here telling them we want to drill a hole in the middle of your concrete beam in a hundred year old building to put a light. They would say, get lost. You're on drugs, right? But by seeing this photograph, they're like, you know what? We have to do this. And then we worked out, we x-rayed the floor, find out where the rebar was, how to place the light fixtures. So by playing and pushing the limits it's really how you can get these jobs kind of installed and really create masterful pieces that someday you're going to want to take your kids to and unlike doing theater that may only last a week or a couple of years on broadway this lasts your entire life and we're really proud to say the disney projects you know the wilderness lodge looks exactly the way it did now even though we've done three additions to it um since 1991 but it stands the test of time. Good design will, even though technology changes, good design will last. Mock-ups, we're taking four existing hotels in Macau and we're turning them into the Londoner. We're building a stage set around there. And if I didn't tell you that and you didn't see the high rise building, you would almost think you were in turn of the century Macau. This job is under construction and our designers go there they test the things, they mock them up, and then they integrate them into the final designs. Okay, I think we're getting somewhat near the end of the time. People are probably zoning off, but I'm gonna go through these, and I've already mentioned this, restaurants, like the faces, the food, the architecture. Just look at the variety of projects. We do all the cheesecake factories, okay? You've probably been in those. You may like the scallops on the wall, you may not. The owner likes that, we integrate those totally different point of view, something that is much more graphic and in your face, using lots of lights so you get soft light on your faces. The highlighting, in this case, through inexpensive track that can light the bar, because Las Vegas has a health code, you need 50 foot candles on the bar. But more importantly, highlighting the, the alcohol. Why? People are moss or attracted to alcohol. They make money by selling alcohol. We want that to be very dry, dynamic, sparkle, draw people's attention. This, this is one of my favorite jobs. Megan, um, a theatrical student did it for us. If you notice, yes, there's general fixtures. Everything has a focus light on it. Tucked between the slats of the wood, there's a spotlight that lights the table. Individual lights that light the curtains. Another fixture that glows softly. Rear illumination of the banquettes. Even the little figurines hold an electric bolt of candle that lights up their face. Everything was tested, predicted, and you put it together and you dim it and you create a wonderful space. But no one walks in and say, this is great space. They say, oh, doesn't this look cool? Or the pendants look neo. Did you notice the little figurines up here? That's when you know you have a successful project. Maybe it's a little bit more loud or visible or in your face. Why? Because they're trying to attract people but in this case, they're competing with the, the casino floor that's right behind them. So maybe it needs to be a little bit more garish to be noticeable. Or once again, the chandelier is the alcohol, building light into it. So that becomes the focal point of the actual space rather than hanging a chandelier over it. 
or historic restoration. How do you put, in this case, a restaurant and intentionally not evenly lighting the faux glass ceilings, but doing it so there's almost a spotlight so it feels a little bit better. If there was just a square of lighting up here, it wouldn't be as interesting. But the intentional up lights on the columns, the chandelier, the lights over the booths, why? We're getting that soft light on the faces. We want it to be flattering for you and for your date when you're there. You know, this almost feels like a train car from the 1920s, but just a layer of elegance through the lighting, the warm tones, the integrations. Once again, you don't see any of our architectural lighting. It's all concealed, but it really creates the space that you want to go in there and you never want to leave. It's soft, it's comfortable, it's quiet. And literally, it's become one of the most um, important gener revenue generating spaces in a casino. The idea, oh, bye, Rich. Okay, we're guys, one guy's leaving here. Um, this is a, a new steakhouse, but the idea of building lights and backlighting surfaces will go through relatively quickly. This is Lindsay, another theatrical designer that works for us. When they showed me this rendering and what they were going to do, backlighting turquoise glass, backlighting a salmon colored bar. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be awful. It's just going to be disgusting. Okay. And I'm like, I don't want my name on this. And Lindsay's like, no, they've done this in, in Europe one other time in France, highlighting the back bar. So we work to create a mood in a sense. And the first time it opened up, I walked in there and I'm like, wow, not only do we have stage lighting that can really put these performers, you are transcended into time. You feel like you're in a speakeasy you know, a hundred years ago, that's the power of design, especially lighting design. We changed people's mood. She, I thought I had done everything. I've done 6,000 jobs. I'm like, this is a disaster, but creativity and a lot of hard work creates new experiences for us. So just remember your learning is never done. Always go out and experience these other spaces. Another life lesson. What do we look for in employees? And some of the mentorees um, probably heard similar to this. What do we look for? Yes, we want good design and technical skills. You don't have to be a 4.0 student, but we want you to be good and talented. But I also know that you need to communicate, whether it's written, can you write a letter? Can you write a report? Can you talk to a person on the phone? And work ethic. We work really hard. We play hard. We have ski retreats. We have houseboat trips. We do all this fun stuff. But we really want you to be balanced and somewhere here in the middle. So think about this as you're putting together your resumes, you're looking for internships. This is typical of what I think a lot of people look for. Now, somebody may want that black cape designer. Fine, just let them know you can still communicate and you still will work hard in things. Um, and somewhere in here is where your sweet spot will be. So that's what we're kind of looking for. Um, we heard on the presentation yesterday that was very similar to some of the other people where we're going through the resume writing skills. If you don't are not involved in the mentor program right now, raise your hand, get involved. I think it's very beneficial, not only for us that are helping, but for the students that are involved. Here's a spa in spaces. I'm just going to go really quickly. Most of the time we have very warm, soothing lighting. This was a project requirement from the interior designer. Once again, my, not my style but very, very, um, I'm going to say, um, well-received project. This is more my style. Like you feel like you're going into a space where you just breathe deep. You relax just by the warmth. Notice you don't see any lights. Okay, it's about lighting architectural surfaces. Or even in this case, it's a little bit um, whiter in nature, but very, very I'm relaxing in the space. So why we're bouncing light off of soft curtains, off of textured walls. We're not pounding the floor with a lot of light. And then just creating, these are simple residential projects. These are probably the bottom of our barrel project, but they're really important. They help sell the project. So that while they're not flashy and exotic, we're about creating spaces that people want to hang out in. And they can become a little bit more architectural. This is the drop-off area where we have a waterfall wall created with electric lighting, a big uh, dome chandelier or torchere. And but it's really about integration, the lighting, putting it where we can. Step lights. Notice there's no big poles where the people will be hanging out. Um, I would love to be able to afford one of these. This is a high-rise project in Taichung. This is the lobby. 
I mean, you feel like you're walking through a museum. This is artwork that's there just to impress the people, the guest of the people that live there. Okay, um, just incredible project. We've probably done about 12 projects for this one client. Each one's getting the next level up, up. Now they're doing cheaper projects. By cheaper, I still mean that a, a condo would probably cost you between 800 and $1.2 million. These are $5 million. So you're dealing with that upper echelon of staff. But when it's retail, I love this job, even though it's in Seattle where it rains a lot, it's all about warmth. Even though we didn't do the signage, we coordinate. So the same color temperature is consistent, whether it's our sconces, our down lights, our poles, the interior lighting of the spaces, that's the coordination, the communication. This is kind of a fun one. Um, we live in Huntington Beach. This is right on the water. How do you feel something that has that old world vibe, but meets the criteria of the new clients? Once again, inexpensive, but very functional, practical type of lighting. Retailing, big box stores. You do a Costco different than you do a boutique. If you know Apple stores, or this is Microsoft stores, the one in New York, where they bounce light through them. We came, or they came to us, they hired us. They said, the number one goal is, we normally go into the mall right across from Apple. Apple stores are bright, I want us to be brighter. Okay, maybe not the brief you want to get, but how can you get it bright while not creating glare in these spaces. Just the opposite end, the Louis Vuitton boutique. It's about low general light, in this case through Soft Cove, but highlighting the products. You know, This could be a $6,000 purse. We want it to jump off the shelf, make people have to have that almost untouchable merchandise. But here, here's a cheap shoe store, just simple lighting that lights the walls, lights the product, kind of creates break spaces where you can try those things on doesn't have to be exotic so each store should have its own storyline other fields that you could consider is entertainment attractions theme parks we just finished one of the biggest theme parks and they just announced its construction i can't tell you about it there's theaters we know the lightning designer for Bruce Springsteen. These guys have wonderful lights. If you like to travel and work all night and things, I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to do that, but no. Um, and there's just so many other options that you can explore if this is of interest to everybody. So that's about as fast as I can go through 35 years of experience. I'll invite Jay back. You can ask the um, last two questions if you want to. I also don't know if you have the format that you can answer questions, but I think I left 10 minutes left for any type of interactive conversation if we want. Well, that's the last question. Is this the best class you've ever had? Uh, look at all those. And you can tell me who the no is, okay? So, no, no. no there I, is no I no. give him that option. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank what, you, Chip. I, I appreciate it. That was, uh, that was a heck of a tour through some really cool projects. What, what I would really say, I think would be amazing is to do this same talk two years from now when the lighting people that are interested in lighting, do the same talk to them and, and just see, you'll learn a lot more the second time through, but you'll also learn that a lot of stuff we shared is really relevant. And I would even say, I would love to do it five years after you're out there in the field and just really see how applicable it is. But we love lighting. We think that we have the best job in the world. You can make a very good living at it if you're good. And I don't mean that to be, um, you know, egotistical, but think of it this way. You know, Patrick Mahomes makes, what, $25 million a year. There's a lot of people that play football that maybe don't work as hard as him, that aren't as talented, um, that don't get $25 million. They don't even get a million dollars, which that may still sound like a lot of money, but you know, you can have a very successful, profitable career, but you have to work hard and you have to be good. And I think that all of you, if you survive this program, you have the talent and hopefully you have the passion to get to that point. We want you all to be MVPs out there. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's something we're intensely proud of here. Um, we, we've had, you know, perfect placement rates for our graduates. Uh, even, even through the economic downturn, uh, we've, uh, we found essentially all of our graduates that wanted a job, uh, could, could find one. So, so it's definitely a great profession to be in. Yeah. And, and what I would just share is, you know, find your passion. You may not know it. I worked for 
um, once again, Lutron. And I could see myself still being there. I had a different opportunity. Yes, I moved to California. I never thought I would be here. And it led to so many other opportunities. So never say never. But more importantly, try to be a sponge. Okay, these things, like if you're not into lighting, hopefully you listen. There was one or two things that you learned from this presentation. I still go to tons of presentations and I should know it all, right? I mean, I'm an expert. I always learn something from a presentation, whether it's a peer or even a, a junior designer. The only way you learn is by going there and exposing yourself to it. So always try to be that sponge. You'll reuse that. And I'm going back to why I started this with Ron Rezik. Create that images series of slides, or I'm going to call it, you know, a, should I say a wallpaper page? No. I mean, the reality is you just want to always think about that and go in spaces with your friends and say, do you like this or don't like it? And then ask the question, why? Right. Ask the yeah. restaurant or what's, what do you like about this? What do you not like, you know, from a design standpoint, you'll learn more that way than you can from reading a book. Trust me. Yeah, that's that's absolutely the truth. That's I I, uh, I judge every restaurant I walk into nowadays. I I mean, hell, I judge the post office. Who am I kidding? When they have mismatched CCT in their ceiling, it drives me nuts. <laughs> but but yeah, lighting is all around us. You know, it's a very everyday thing, and and uh, and that's why uh, to segue us into the homework assignment. Why the first homework assignment? The the point of it is for you to um, take a take three photos of uh, lighting that you experience in your everyday life. Just have your phones with you. I'm not asking for a, for professional quality photos. I'm asking for a photo of lighting you find interesting over the course of the next several days. Um, the, uh, the assignment is due uh, before class on Monday. And uh, with that, uh, let's, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording formally. Um, Do they get